This lecture recital brings together some of our favourite compositions by Luca Marenzio, a 16th century Italian composer who wrote over 400 madrigals and had a significant influence on those who came after him. Over the last eight years in Fieri, we've loved performing the music from this genre, and in particular, we've really enjoyed singing Marenzio's writing. The fact that he was such an accomplished singer himself surely must have something to do with it. Not only are the lines particularly satisfying for each singer individually, but when they come together, you become part of a glorious sound world. Born in 1553, Marenzio spent his early professional life working most likely as a singer in Rome, entering the household of Cardinal Luigi d'Este when he was 25 years old. He worked for him for eight years, and during this time became internationally famous as a composer, publishing many volumes of madrigals, the first in 1580, from which we have chosen Dolorosi Martyr. A popular poem by Petrarch, it depicts grievous martyrdoms and fierce torments, which Marenzio paints with compositional devices which were once considered too extreme for English tastes. He illustrates the tormented afflictions with his renowned skill for word painting. For example, to describe the harsh fetters and chains of misery, the five voices overlap each other with intricate rhythms, then suddenly become bound together as they sing homophonically. You can download translations of all of these pieces from our website at fiericonsort.co.uk.
Although he remained largely in Rome during the 1580s, Lorenzo spent time in Ferrara with his patron, and most likely composed works there. The music of our next composer, Cipriano d'Aurore, will have been known by Lorenzo, especially given d'Aurore's stature in Ferrara at the time. Although it seems the two never met, there are examples of Dorore's influence in Lorenzo's works exemplified in the latter's extraordinary range and endless variety and reliance on harmonic language for text expression. It has been said that Franco-Flemish composer Cipriano Dorore burst onto the scene in dramatic fashion, publishing Madrigali a Cinque Voci in Venice in 1542. His madrigal O Sonno, our next piece, is taken from Il Secondo Libro di Madrigali a Quattro Voci. The singers are imploring sleep to come to them, and the piece begins in almost complete homophony, giving the text as much clarity and attention as the music allows. The piece can be seen as a microcosmic example of Dorore's developing compositional style, taking the chanson-like homophony of the previous generation's madrigals and altering it. The Rory gently unpicks the thread, holding the parts together, that they might be restitched, culminating in the final two lines' impassioned cries, with their strikingly high entries for the singers.
Another composer around at the same time as Morenzio was Marc Antonio Ingenieri. Although not much is known about the beginning of his life, it is thought that he might have studied with Dorore. What we do know is that he spent his later life as Maestro di Capella at Cremona Cathedral, and it was while there that he became famous being the teacher of a young Claudio Monteverdi. The next piece we move on to is Ingegneri setting of Dolorosi Martir. Typically, Ingegneri is more conservative in his musical approach, with his simple harmonic language and polyphonic techniques from the stile antico, ancient style, as used by composers such as Palestrina. However, you catch glimpses of the stile moderno in such phrases as misero piango il mio perduto bene, miserable I mourn my loss, where the chromaticism and vivid word painting sounds much closer to Morenzio's more modern approach to composition. You are now going to hear two settings of Petrarch's text Cefero Torna, the first by Morenzio and the second by Claudio Monteverdi. Morenzio was slightly older than Monteverdi and in fact composed his setting almost 30 years earlier, which has inevitably sparked the question, did Morenzio influence Monteverdi's music? 
Well, Monteverdi's music represents the full realisation of the Seconda Pratica, a new style that in the late Renaissance develops musical fashion away from the Prima Pratica, i.e. the sort of polyphony exemplified by, say, Palestrina. So what defines the Seconda Pratica? Well, one aspect is an increased use of extreme and expressive dissonance and chromaticism, and the other is a more structural change away from the texture of true polyphony, i.e. parts singing their lines entirely separate to one another, towards what we now think of as homophony or monody, which is either one line plus an accompaniment, or parts singing their lines together at the same time in groups of two or three, or as an entire ensemble. But of course, Monteverdi didn't do this alone, and there were a number of interconnected composers such as De Rore, Vert, Gesualdo, numerous others that make up a progressive line of musicians and intellectuals challenging the status quo in the second half of the 1500s. However, some single out Marenzio as having a more direct influence in paving the way for Monteverdi to fully realise this new style of composition, and there is evidence to indicate as such. For example, when constructing his fifth book of madrigals, Monteverdi very clearly looks to Morenzio's madrigal books for guidance on structure. Furthermore, the first madrigal in this fifth book references one of Morenzio's particularly controversial pieces by setting the same text and including a number of musical quotations. It is in this fifth book of madrigals that Monteverdi really truly embraces the new Seconda Pratica, and many argue that the direct reference to Morenzio is actually an outward signal from Monteverdi that he is no longer following the more traditional models of composition and is instead following the line of new progressive musical style for which Morenzio was at the time already well known. Even here, although composed 18 years after Morenzio's death, Monteverdi's setting of Zefaro Torma once again contains a number of musical references to the older composer's setting of the same text.
Maranzio's music was important in not just in Italy, but across Europe. And we know that the Italian style had a particular importance in England. Many composers and musicians travelled extensively and collections of music were published or copied abroad. The 1588 collection, known as Musica Transalpina, is an important example of Italian music that became popular in England. It was retexted in English and published in London, allowing for a deeper understanding of the Italian compositional technique. The English composer John Dowland would have been exposed to this style, and he was certainly aware of Morenzio's work. We know that he set out in 1595 to meet Morenzio in Rome, and made it as far as Florence, but perhaps no further. The next piece we are presenting is typically melancholic, with, full of, with text full of sorrow and lament. The melody is in the soprano part, while the remaining performers sing the harmony, which otherwise might have been done on a lute. This is John Dowland's All Ye Whom Love and Fortune Hath Betrayed. The final two pieces come from the madrigal song cycle Sequel de Law by Luca Morenzio, which takes up about half of Morenzio's sixth book of madrigals for six voices. The poetry is written by Luigi Tanzillo, a poet based at the court of Naples in the mid-16th century. The rest of the songs in Morenzio's sixth book are mostly settings of poetry by Petrarch, whose famous collection of poetry, Il Canzoniere, helped establish the tradition of introspective philosophical love poetry. By the time we come to the seventh poem, which we'll begin singing in a moment, the text begins a different dawn, a different orient, as the narrator looks for a new perspective on the prevailing themes of love, despair and death. In the eighth madrigal, the narrator asks if heaven gave the lover to them, why does heaven now take the lover away? Although it's clear that there is a kind of physical and psychological distancing taking place between narrator and lover, 
The poetry deliberately blurs a true sense of narrative to make this more about the philosophy of love and the self than any specific story of love. Maranzio's setting of this poetry is impressive and important for the way that he latches onto this idea musically, with his use of chromaticism, angularity and declamation as he sought to push musical boundaries of expression from his time. All the introspective love philosophy of Tansillo is mirrored in the beautiful but challenging harmonies of Morenzio. He squeezes parts together for important moments in the text and uses gaps in the music to show changes of thought and emotion. Listen out for that now. <laughs> 